member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Madame la Présidente, uh, I'm rising to recognize an individual in my riding who passed away earlier this year. He was a friend. Next week we will be celebrating his life, Dr. Lennox Hines, who was an outstanding public servant, served Canada for 35 years. He was believed in uh, political engagement. He was a liberal. Um, I've known him for over 25 years. I was just a young um, adolescent when I met Dr. Len Hines and he's always been proven to be a friend, to provide sound advice. Sometimes I would have to uh, keep his doors, was the last one uh, during elections, because he'd always want to have a drink and chat about politics. My sincere condolences to his wife, Marjorie, and his family. You will be missed. The Honourable Member for Calgary Centre. Thank you, Madam Speaker. On April 22nd, John Adams, the President of Valor Canada, presented the annual General Sir Arthur Curry Award to one of Calgary's finest, George Brookman, often referred to as Mr. Calgary. There is much I can say about George and his contributions to Calgary and to Canada, but I'd be here for quite a while. His recognition for this award is due to his role in steering events that contribute to our understanding and support of our military. Like the general honoured in the award he received, George Brookman is a true leader. Thank you, George, for all you do for Canada's military heritage, and so much more. Valor Canada is an organization that educates young Canadians about our shared military heritage by developing learning opportunities to foster a deeper understanding of who we are as individuals, citizens, and as a nation. To John Adams and his team at Valor Canada, thank you. We are indebted to you for your work. The Honourable Member for Surrey Centre. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Surrey is a young city. With over 35,000 individuals aged between 19 and 25, Surrey is home to the largest number of youths in all of BC. It is no surprise that our youth are at the forefront of Surrey's growth and innovation. Every year, the Surrey Board of Trade recognizes 25 outstanding youth with their Surrey's Top 25 Under 25 Award. This award pays homage to business and community-minded youth, recognizes their position as a role model for their community. From focusing on drug and opioid abuse prevention to advocating uh, for increased senior support to the promotion of arts and culture in youth, Surrey's top 25 under 25 are represented in every corner of the city. I wanted to give a spe special shout out to my former staffer, Harjot Kalar, and volunteer, Sohana Gill, who have both been recognized for their community service with this award. Congratulations to all the recipients of this amazing award. The Honourable Deputy d'Orléans. Madame la Présidente, today we are welcoming the Canadian Remembrance Doors to Parliament Hill. The Remembrance Doors was created by accomplished McMaster students and now serves as an important symbol for the contribution of Canadian veterans. The founder of this torch, Karen Hunter, whose family has long tradition of serving in our armed forces, was the visionary behind the symbol. It is a symbol of gratitude for peace and freedom and serves to bring awareness of Canada's military contribution in the liberation of the Netherlands during the Second World War. This summer, it will continue its journey by traveling to France to commemorate the 80th anniversary of D-Day at Juno Beach. I want to say thanks to Karen and her students for undertaking this project, dedicated to remembering those who have fought for the freedoms that we so much cherish. Merci. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent, Madam Speaker, after nine years of this Liberal government, after nine inflationary deficit budgets, this government is just not worth the cost. And on top of that, it can count on its extravagant ally, the Bloc Québécois, which voted in favour of $500 billion in spending. That's centralizing spending, inflationary spending. And the Bloc Québécois said yes to everything. The result of that is that everything is more expensive for Quebecers and Canadians. Yesterday, at the National Assembly of Quebec, the leader of the Parti Québécois condemned this federal government's mismanagement of public funds. In fact, this Liberal Party go government's mismanagement is becoming an argument for Quebec independence. And I would just remind us that the Bloc Québécois voted in favour of $500 billion in spending. 
When will this prime minister stop his wasteful spending, supported by the Bloc Québécois? Bills. Madam Speaker, as we speak, Rafah, the last place where Netanyahu's regime told Palestinians to evacuate, is being invaded and innocents suffer. Our allies have warned Netanyahu not to proceed with this invasion, or they will pause military exports. My constituents have been clear that they want us to do the same. The people of Israel have the support of Canada, but that does not mean supporting Netanyahu and his regime's indiscriminate war against the people of Palestine. Canada has continued calling for a ceasefire, the release of hostages, and sustained humanitarian aid, but we can be that stronger force to build a better, long-term solution so that Palestinian people can live in peace, security, and dignity, coexisting with Israelis and all in the Middle East. The ongoing violence has defined generations of lives over the last 75 years. Don't they all deserve to live, live in peace, Madam Speaker? Member for Pitt Meadows, Maple Ridge. Madam Speaker, after nine years of this Liberal NDP government, thousands upon thousands are overdosing every year on our streets or in their homes. 42,000 deaths under the watch of this Prime Minister. I can't count how many heartbroken parents and family members I've met who have lost loved ones to this scourge. The results of legalized hard drugs, safe supply, and a toothless criminal justice system has been death and destruction, ca chaos and carnage in Canadian hospitals, playgrounds, parks, and public transportation. Our beautiful country is being destroyed by radical liberal and wacko NDP drug policies. The Liberals must not allow the legalization of hard drugs to be expanded to other cities like Toronto or Montreal after the clear failures in BC and Oregon. What they are doing is absolutely not working. Common sense conservatives will ban hard drugs, stop taxpayer funded drugs and put that money into de detox and recovery. The Honourable Member for Calgary Forest Law. Carbon tax Carney's crusade to be coordinated as Liberal leader is in full swing. He's preaching the same radical agenda as this woke Prime Minister that doubled rents, mortgages, all on his path to quadrupling the carbon tax scam. Canadians are terrified at what carnage Carney will create. His silence on Liberal waste speaks volumes as this Prime Minister sends more taxpayer dollars and interest payments to Carney's Bay Street buddies than what goes to health transfers or to national defense and after speaking at Senate he fled to rub elbows with Ottawa High Society to preach his radical agenda. He's more comfortable with Davos elites than in a room full of everyday hard-working struggling Canadians. Carbon tax Carney needs to show some courage, show up to the Finance Committee so he can answer what destructive path he'll take this country down. No common sense Canadian can say that carbon tax Carney, the next Liberal leader, is any different than this woke, radical, out of touch, Prime Minister. The Honourable Member for Longueuil, Charlemagne. Madam Speaker, today I rise to pay tribute to an exceptional administrator. May I start from the beginning, Madam Chair? You will, please. Thank you. Madame la Présidente. Madam Speaker, today I rise to pay tribute to an exceptional administrator. Over the last decade, he contributed significantly to supporting young adults in my writing. I'm talking about Sylvain Lambert. He's been working in the Collegiate Network for 20 years and nine years as principal of Edouard Montpetit CIGEP and the École Nationale d'Aérotechnique in Longueuil. In July, he will be leaving to take on new challenges. I was lucky to work with Sylvain in my former life as a school administrator and later as an MP. And I can speak to his remarkable personal and professional qualities. I'd like to thank him for everything he's done for the CJEP community. Sylvain, I wish you great luck and happiness in all of your projects to come. Our Vancouver East. CMHC is going to end the rent gear to income subsidy to some of the homes under the federal government's bilateral agreement with provinces. 
nonprofits are forced to jack up the rent to market rates after the existing tenants move out. That means thousands of affordable homes will be lost forever. This move is beyond stupid. It shows the Liberals have learned nothing from the housing crisis that they helped create. Already, between successive Liberal and Conservative governments, Canada has lost more than a million affordable homes. For every home built, 11 is lost. Canada cannot continue down this track. Communities cannot afford to lose more affordable housing stock. This giving with the right and taking with the left, sleight of hand, will fool no one. The housing crisis will only get worse, and the Liberals will have no one to blame but themselves. The rent geared to income subsidies must continue. Honorable Deputy de Drummond. Madame la Présidente. The Honorable Member for Drummond. Madam Speaker, Drummond's Volunteer Action Centre is celebrating its 45th birthday, and I was there to celebrate it. The room was full of people, generous volunteers who make calls, support people, bring vulnerable or vulnerable individuals and seniors to their medical appointments. They support people who are going through tumultuous periods in their lives. Last year, they helped 14,000 people and 200 organizations with 37,000 hours of volunteer work. They care deeply about people. We're so lucky to have them. This organization has been working for 45 years. It does so much. It has a tax clinic, tax clinic, a Meals on Wheels service, and volunteers are at the very heart of what the organization does. They create friendships, help people, and inspire the entire community. Happy birthday. Thank you for being there to help people in our community. The Honorable Member for New Brunswick, New Brunswick Southwest. Speaker. Newfoundland and Labrador has contributed much to our great dominion, but few gifts from the rock rival that of the now departed Rex Murphy. Inspired by his firm belief that Canada was founded on great principles, had achieved great things in the past, and could and should do much more in the future, Rex stood on guard for all of us with great wit and wisdom throughout his many newspaper columns and on-air commentaries. Rex was brave, but without pretense. He despised the smug. He understood and championed everyday Canadians, especially those who struggled. He appreciated the inherent fallen nature of humankind, as well as our ability to rise above our failings through the pursuit of virtue. God bless Canada. God bless Newfoundland Labrador. And God bless the soul of Raphael Rex Murphy. Sure. The Honourable Member for Hamilton Mountain. Speaker. <clears throat> Speaker, the Hamilton Reads title for 2024 is Chrysalis, the first book by Hamilton Mountain's own Anuja Varghese. It won a Governor General's Literary Award, a Writer's Trust Award, and several other honours. It's a book dedicated to, quote, all the girls and women who don't see themselves in most stories. You are worthy of reflection, despite what you've been told. And Speaker, it's a really fun read. And Nuja told me she's always looking for ways to empower women and girls, and sometimes that means you get to be a shapeshifter and eat your enemies. She says fantasy fiction helps us let loose, wonder what if, and consider difficult subjects like racism, homophobia, and misogyny in stories rather than statistics. Anuja unleashed her inner writer when she moved to Hamilton and found the community that inspired her and the support that helped her flourish. I want to congratulate Anuja on her success, thank her for the delicious stories, and tell her Hamilton is very glad she now calls our city home. Oral questions, questions are hand, Honourable Member for South Surrey. After nine years, this Prime Minister is not worth the drugs disorder and death. Open access to meth and fentanyl is killing Canadians. BC parents are terrified that children will step on dirty needles on soccer fields. Nurses are breathing in fentanyl smoke as they treat patients in hospitals. On May 21st, Parliament will vote on our motion to ensure this extremist drug experiment is never repeated. Will the Prime Minister vote to reject expansion and prioritize treatment and recovery? Yes or no? Yes. 
être des dépendants. Too many Canadians are dying every day from an ever-changing illegal toxic drug supply. The opposition leader talks about investing in treatment, but conservatives cut two-thirds of drug treatment fund when they were last in government. Let's talk about what saves li lives. Safe consumption sites, accessible social and health care services, prevention, treatment, and harm reduction. This is a public health crisis, not a criminal justice issue. Okay. Okay. Remember for South Surrey White Rock. Well, after nine years, Madam Speaker, it's on them, and they have to do something about it. The Liberal leadership race is well underway, I see, and it seems like the new guy is just like the old guy. Mark Carney testified at the Senate, and surprise, surprise, he announced his support for this Prime Minister's failed carbon tax. Carbon tax Carney couldn't commit to cutting a penny from the Prime Minister's reckless spending. These random Liberals really have a lot in common. If carbon tax Carney won't, and this Prime Minister won't, will someone over there have Canadians' backs and axe the tax? If we're going to talk about having Canadians back, let's talk about the work that we're doing to protect the environment while making the life more affordable for them through the carbon rebates. Right. In fact, if you look at economists, and over 300 economists have signed a letter stating this very fact, Canadians receive more on average through the rebate than they pay through any carbon pricing. That's in right. fact, in Ontario, the average family at the end of the year has $300 more through the carbon rebate. I'm listening to The Economist and I'm seeing it standing up and having a back for Canadians. Well, I'm listening to the parliamentary budget officer who says the exact opposite to what that That's member right. just said. Right. Inflationary budgets destroy the working class with high interest rates. After nine years, mortgages, down payments, rents have all doubled. 90% of young Canadians are stuck in housing hell with their dreams of home ownership shattered. Those who do own fear they can't qualify for renewal. Mortgage delinquencies are up 50% overall, 135% in Ontario, 62% in BC. This is a All parliamentary secretary. Once again, if the member opposite wants to talk about what the parliamentary budget officer said, yep. he said eight out of ten families end up with more money at the end of the year through the carbon rebates, through the carbon prices. But also, if we're going to talk about protecting homes at the very moment that houses were burning in Kelowna Lake Country from climate climate uh, crisis fires, wildfires, that member was opposing the carbon price. The carbon price that actually results in a third of our emissions. The Honourable de Charlebourg, Haute Saint-Charles. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint-Charles. Madam Speaker, the, bank, uh, the Governor of the Bank of Canada has repeatedly confirmed that the Prime Minister's spending is keeping interest rates high. Many mortgage holders will face sharp increases in payments when they renew their mortgages over the next couple of years. This is the direct result of this Prime Minister's $500 billion in centralizing inflationary spending backed by the bloc. When will the Prime Minister and the bloc stop their out-of-control spending? The Honourable Minister... My colleague talks about sound management and the what was the record of the conservative leader when he was housing minister? He got six affordable housing units built, whereas in my colleague's uh, riding over the past year, hundreds of units have been built. We signed a historic agreement with the government of Quebec. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Charlebourg to Saint Charles. Madam Speaker, the minister's been repeating the same infantile answer uh, while the Liberal government has doubled the cost of housing. July 1st is shaping up to be a disaster for those looking for a place to live. One of the local organizations says that we're heading for the worst July 1st of our lives. This block backed government has created disastrous economic conditions for people looking for housing. Will the Prime Minister shape up and stop the inflationary spending that's only putting pressure on the economy and on Canadians? The Honourable Minister. Good morning, Madam Speaker. We're talking, 
the, he talked about childish calculations. Well, yeah, this is an easy one. Counting to six, six affordable housing units is what the conservative leader managed to get built in his tenure as housing minister. So talk about childish, whereas 222 units have been built in the members' riding uh, in cooperation with the government in Quebec. The Honourable Member for Manicouagan. Madam Speaker, the unfortunate thing about the member for Glengarry Prescott Russell's insults is that they hindered opportunities for substantive conversations about French. While he publicly humiliated himself, the report of the Commissioner of Official Languages went almost unnoticed. But the Commissioner severely criticized the federal government, calling it reluctant, reluctant to offer services in French, and reluctant about allowing Francophones to work in their own language. Instead of insulting Quebecers, shouldn't the Liberals have announced this week that they're finally going to force the federal government to respect Francophones? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Look, on this side of the House, we've always been there for Francophones in Canada and in Quebec. And I find it really interesting coming from my colleague because when the Bloc tries to monopolize this file, they're bothered by the fact that our government and my colleague from Glengarry Prescott Russell, all the liberals on this side who are from Quebec, and I would say our whole caucus even, defends French in Quebec and all across the country. We're the only government that does that. The Honourable Member for Manicouagan. Madam Speaker, the Liberal Member for Glengarry Prescott Russell devoted his 15 minutes of fame to denying the decline of French in Quebec. An odd choice. A very odd choice at a time when the Commissioner of Official Languages is pointing out that in his region along the Ottawa River, that's where he gets the most complaints from. These include complaints from federal public servants who are unable to work in French. The Commissioner said the complaints received attest to the fact that many federal institutions don't take their ling language obligations seriously. If the Liberals don't take the future of French seriously, why should the federal government? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, I'm Madam Speaker, rather. Let's talk about our government's investments under our action plan. $1.4 billion for the next five years to help French. Madam Speaker, we're the only government that has acknowledged the decline in French. We've modernized the Official Languages Act. We're working with Treasury Board. We're working with the Commissioner. And we fully understand the issue. Here on this side of the House, we believe in French. They don't. A recent report reveals alarming rates of poverty and food insecurity in Nova Scotia, the highest in the country. But the Liberals, like the Conservatives before them, are choosing to reward grocery CEOs with corporate handouts instead of cracking down on their greed that is driving up food costs. So while the Conservatives vote against nutritious uh, meals for kids at school, the Liberals are letting food conglomerates gouge Canadians at the till. Why is this government allowing the CEO's greed to go unchecked at the costs of Canadians going hungry? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Well, I agree with the Honourable Member that it's certainly uh, hypocritical for Conservatives to cite food bank lineups as something that they care about when voting uh, against a national school food program that's going to feed over 400,000 kids per year. That's hypocritical if I've ever heard it before. But it's very good to hear my uh, member uh, or my colleague in the NDP party who we've worked with successfully to update our Competition Act in successive rounds, which are going to improve prices for Canadians and increase competition, which is, I think, vitally important. Great answer. Member for Nanaimo, Ladysmith. Madam Speaker, rent is going up faster than Canadians can afford, with families relying on credit cards more and more to buy food and necessities. In my riding of Nanaimo, Ladysmith, rent went up over 9% last year alone. People can't cut back any more than they already are, yet the Liberals are sitting on their hands and letting corporate greed drive up costs. This plan is not working. When will the Liberals have the courage to crack down on the corporate greed driving up rent and food prices? The Honourable Minister. 
Uh, Madam Speaker, I thank my honourable colleague for the question and I point to the recent federal budget where we announced that we would be taking measures to prevent uh, corporate landowners from buying up single-family homes, but also advancing measures to protect renters and to bring down the cost of rent by adding more supply. We are moving forward with programs that introduce low-cost financing for more rental construction. We've got new subsidies for affordable housing and cooperative housing and an acquisition for non-profits who can actually take affordable homes and keep them affordable in perpetuity. In addition, Madam Speaker, we're moving forward forward with the Renters' Bill of Rights and a series of other measures that are designed to protect the interest of renters for whom the cost of living has simply become too high. The Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, Samilkan in uh, Nicola. Madam Speaker, after nine years of this SPEND-EP Liberal government, finding an affordable rental is only getting harder. Despite their record spending, a new report says that rents in Canada increased 9.3 percent annually in April. It's gotten so bad that people seeking an affordable uh, rental, own, their only choice, Madam Speaker, is to to laugh or cry. Given the dire situation of these renters, could the Minister of Housing please enlighten us as to whether he considers the performance of his government's housing strategy a comedy of errors or a tragedy of oversights? The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, if my honourable friend is interested in a tragedy of oversights, I would direct him to the plan put forward by his leader when it comes to housing, which doesn't advance a single measure designed to help renters with the cost of living. Madam Speaker, his plan that he is now campaigning on would literally increase taxes on rental construction in this country by putting the GST back on those construction projects. We have removed the GST, Madam Speaker. We have introduced low-cost financing to build more rental supply to bring down the cost across the ecosystem, across the country. In addition, Madam Speaker, we are putting more money on the table to provide affordable housing options with the Conservatives. The Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, Samilkan and Nicola. A lot of that spending doesn't kick in until after the next election, so I don't think that promise is worth the paper the Minister has written on. This week, the Bank of Canada warned, and I quote, higher debt servicing costs reduce a household's financial flexibility, making them more financially vulnerable if their income declines or they face an unexpected material expense, end quote. Considering the Prime Minister has doubled our debt and has borrowed more money than all Canadian Prime Ministers combined, could he please explain how this warning does not equally apply to his government? The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, first to correct the misinformation, there is money flowing to projects, including in that member's province as we speak. We've signed billion, multi-billion dollar deals with provinces to build housing. We've invested billions more to now ha help the construction of nearly 500,000 units since the inception of the National Housing Strategy. But Madam Speaker, he seems to ignore the fact that Canada maintains one of the healthiest fiscal positions of, amongst advanced economies. I expect he's trying to distract because they've had a very bad week when Canadians are focused on their use of the notwithstanding clause to a Road important rights that are protected by the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Madam Speaker, we will move forward with the Honourable Member for Kelowna Lake Country. Madam Speaker, after nine years of this NDP Liberal government, deficit spending caused a skyrocketing inflation, which caused higher interest rates, which is causing higher mortgage payments. Right. The Bank of Canada confirmed that the Prime Minister's wasteful spending is keeping interest rates higher for longer. Now the Bank of Canada is warning, when compared with origination, that the average median mortgage payment will rise more than 20 per cent in 2025 and 30 per cent in 2026. Families can't afford this. Will this government stop their deficit spending so families can keep their homes? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, what I would like to ask the member opposite who just asked that question is how does she face her constituents when at the very time that homes were being evacuated, people were losing homes to climate-induced wildfires, she was fighting the, uh, the price on carbon pollution and fighting our work on making sure that we fight climate change. This is what's actually putting homes at risk. We're going to be supporting our firefighters who are fighting those fires. We're going to be doing what we need to fight climate change, and we are protecting Canadians. The Honourable Member for Kelowna Lake Country. Well, Madam Speaker, after nine years, this Prime Minister just isn't worth the cost. Right. For families with variable rate mortgages with fixed payments, it's even worse. Median mortgage payments will increase 60 per cent by 2026. Working class paychecks have been shredded by this NDP Liberal government. Common sense Conservatives would bring in a dollar for dollar law to fund a dollar of savings for every new dollar spent. This is how families run their households. Can the Minister explain how Canadian families are supposed to come up with hundreds or thousands of dollars more a month just to keep their homes? 
Great question. The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, we understand the very serious challenges that families are facing when it comes to the cost of housing, which is why we put a plan on the table that's designed to solve Canada's national housing crisis. What's fascinating about the member's own riding, we've actually invested $31.5 million in that community to build thousands of homes, which she and her party oppose. Moreover, the Conservative plan lists only 22 communities in the entire country that can benefit that can benefit from their plans. Kelowna is not on the list. I hope she has a hard time explaining that to her constituents who thanked us for the investment we made to build housing in her community. The Honourable Member for Bellechasse, Les Etchemins Lévis. Madam Speaker, Quebecers are suffering after nine years of this Liberal government's wasteful spending and what that's doing to the cost of living. This Prime Minister's overspending knows no bounds, and the Bloc supports all the reckless spending. The Bloc voted to hire another 110,000 federal public servants. The Bloc is okay with sending Quebecers money to Ottawa, and they call themselves the Defenders of Quebec. When will this Bloc-backed Prime Minister stop making Quebecers suffer even more with his senseless spending sprees, the Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, my colleague is referring to sound management. Did you know that during his entire tenure, the Conservative leader, when he was Minister of Housing, built six affordable housing units? You saw that right, Madam Speaker, six units. And in Lévis, 205 affordable housing units have been built in recent months, and we expect to build, build 8,000 under our deal with the Government of Quebec. The Honourable Member for Belle Chasse, Les Echemins Lévis. After nine years of this Liberal government, there's been nine years of suffering for Quebecers. Budget chaos, criminals on the loose, unaffordable food and housing. And instead of, about, of thinking about fixing the budget, the Bloc supports $500 billion in reckless inflationary spending. The more this Bloc-backed government spends, the more Quebecers suffer. The Prime Minister and the Bloc aren't worth the cost. Could they spare a thought for Quebecers and stop wasting their money? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm so pleased to have a second opportunity to talk about the 205 affordable housing units that we have created in the members' riding because of the re leadership of this government and the government of Quebec. 205 affordable units that have been built in the last few months. There's more coming, unfortunately, and this is less good news for the Conservative leader because during his uh, tenure, only six units of this kind were built in the entire country. The Honourable Member for Repentigny. Madam Speaker, while Ottawa keeps saying all is well in the fight against climate change, the experts have never been so pessimistic. The Guardian surveyed 380 IPCC climate specialists. 77 percent of them believe global warming will surpass 2.5 degrees, far above the target set out in the Paris Agreement. More than three out of four experts believe that governments and the oil lobby are leading us to a disaster. Meanwhile, this government inaugurates the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Do they have their priorities right? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, Madam Speaker, two weeks ago, our report showed that our emissions were dropping. Under the Conservatives, they were on an uptick, but we have changed things and emissions are coming down in Canada. So we're doing what needs to be done. We're getting it right. We're on a good trajectory. And when you look the, at the data, it shows the Honourable Member for Repentigny. 77% of climate experts think we're heading for disaster. Only 6% think there's still a chance of meeting the Paris targets. Meanwhile, in Ottawa, the Liberals are in inaugurating their new tar sands oil pipeline, and we have the Conservative, whose only vaguely environmental measure is their crusade against Tim Hortons, paper straws, and lids. Frankly, it's pathetic. What's it going to take for Canada to listen to science and stop sabotaging the fight against climate change? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. 
Ma Madam Speaker. I fully agree that when you see that the conservatives are taking issue with Tim Horton's straws because they're trying to adjust to climate change and recycle more, I really don't understand their objection. But here on this side, it's quite the opposite. We are doing what needs doing to reduce emissions. And uh, UN study shows that we're on the right track. So if the bloc could keep working with us, we can have more clean energy here in Canada. Lakes Brook. Speaker, in Food Ontario's 2023 reports, over 800,000 Ontarians accessed food banks, up 38% from the previous year, which was the largest single year ever increase ever recorded. Even worse, a report by Canada's food professor found that nearly 60% of Canadians are eating expired food to make ends meet. The cost of food, fueled by the carbon tax and inflation, are causing families to suffer. When will the Prime Minister admit his carbon tax scheme has failed and axe the tax? Here, here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Disingenuous. That's what you call it when someone says they care about something but then do the exact opposite. That's today's Conservatives for you. They claim to care about people in food bank lineups, but oppose our plan to feed 400,000 more children per year. They claim to care about housing, but oppose our investments to build 3.9 million more homes by 2031. Shame. They claim to care about affordability, but oppose our investments to help Canadians with the cost of seeing a dentist, getting childcare, or accessing life-saving medication. Shame. It's clear Conservatives would make cuts that hurt families and a big... member for Halliburton, Comartal Lakes, Brock. Speaker, those Liberal policies are not working. I just talked about the rising cost of food. Three out of five Canadians are eating expired food just to survive. More Ontarians than ever are using food banks. In my own area, the Kawartha Lakes Food Source reports that total visits to the food banks they serve have increased by 10% to almost 14,000. After nine years of this carbon tax rhetoric, I get that it's hard for the Prime Minister to admit he's not worth the cost, but the facts speak for themselves. When will the Prime Minister admit his failed carbon tax doesn't work? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. The facts are, Madam Speaker, that Conservatives will never stand up when they have the opportunity to support Canadians. They won't support feeding more hungry children. They won't support building more homes. They won't support access to life-saving medication. They are disingenuous at best. The hypocrisy is over the top. Uh, we see every day in this House that they complain, they holler from the other side, they play politics, they advance slogans and not solutions. Here we are standing up for Canadians. I don't know what they're doing on the other side. Honourable member for Red Deer, Lacombe. After nine years of reckless spending, Canadians are at a breaking point. With record demand at our food banks, we have now learned that 60% of Canadians have resorted to eating expired food. Yet this NDP Liberal government can't help themselves. They have hiked the carbon tax another 23% on April 1st as part of their plan to quadruple it by 2030. Why does this Prime Minister hate Canadians who just want to heat their home, feed their kids, and drive to work? Why won't he just axe the tax? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, Conservatives talk down our economy every day in this House, while in reality Canada's economy has shown great resilience despite the global shocks that it's been under. We have the lowest debt-to-GDP ratio, the lowest deficit in the G7, a triple-A credit rating that's been reaffirmed. Warren Buffett, while talking about investing in Canada, says, we do not feel uncomfortable in any way, shape or form putting money into Canada. The IMF, in the most recent fiscal monitor, rated Canada as number one for budget balance. And this year's budget puts our healthy national balance sheet to work. The Honourable Member for Moose Jaw Lake Centre Lenigan. Madam Speaker, after nine years of this NDP Liberal government, this Prime Minister is just not worth the cost. Food banks are on the brink. Demand is up and donations are down. The Moose Jaw Food Bank helped nearly 8,000 households in 2023, up 58%. 
Madam Speaker, Moose Jaw has a population of 33,000 people. The sad reality is that this is what this government has created. When will the Prime Minister axe the tax to make food affordable again for Canadians? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, it is so rich hearing the Conservatives again cite food bank lineups and continually uh, rage farm off the suffering of Canadians when they will not step up when given the opportunity to support feeding 400,000 more kids per year. This is something that I advocated for for many years before getting into politics. I know many members of this House are encouraged by the fact that our government has made a $1 billion commitment to feed more hungry children in this country. I don't understand how the... The Honourable Member for London, Fanshawe. Liberals are out of touch with everyday Canadians, and Conservatives are worse. After voting no to free medication, the member for Lambton Kent Middlesex wants people to know the real problem isn't that they have to pay out of pocket for care. No, no, the real problem is Tim Hortons and their new paper coffee cups. While new Democrats are getting free dental care and pharma care for Canadians, Liberals delay and Conservatives obstruct support for people. Oh, and also they blast coffee lids. Why is this government like the Conservatives so completely out to lunch with the reality of everyday Canadians? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for her advocacy. Uh, there's nothing more fundamental. You want to talk about liberty? There's nothing more fundamental than having the liberty and autonomy over your own body. And it was so disappointing to see Conservative MPs out making speeches trying to tell our daughters and our sisters what they can do with their bodies. Well, I'm here to say that our party, the Liberal Party and our Prime Minister and every member of our caucus stands firmly behind not only a woman's right to choose when it comes to making a choice over her body, but to make sure that she has the reproductive medicine so she has full autonomy and control over her own body. The Honourable Member for Fort Moody it's National Caregiver Month, and 50% of women are taking care of their elderly parents or loved ones with a disability. And one in five of those caregivers report spending more than $1,000 a month to take care of their loved one. And these costs are only going up. The Liberals keep letting women down. For years, the Liberals promised families a simple, refundable caregiver tax credit. They haven't delivered. When will the Liberals give women the respect they deserve and finally make the caregiver tax credit refundable? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, our government has stepped up and implemented the law. We have introduced the disability benefit and this benefit is the single largest light item in the budget, $6.1 billion over six years. This is an important first step, a step that will help Canadians alleviate poverty. We need to build upon this. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Minister of Sport and Physical Activity has said all along that Canadians deserve a safe, inclusive and welcoming sports system. Our sports system needs to be grounded in human rights. Accountability, integrity and safety need to be at the centre of sport governance and operations. Can the Minister update the House on her progress to create a safer sports system in Canada, one that reflects and celebrates our Canadian values? The Honourable Minister of Sports. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We've heard very clearly about the need for systemic reform and culture change in sport. Survivors have bravely come forward so that we can learn, better protect our kids, and improve our systems and processes. What's been going on in sport, the maltreatment, the abuse, the discrimination, is unacceptable and has to stop. And that's why we announced the creation of the Future in Sport Commission, the membership of which we announced yesterday. Madam Speaker, along with the member from uh, Lac Saint Louis, all of us here in this House, indeed all Canadians, need to build for our children the sports system that's safe and that they deserve. Here, here. Honourable Member for Langley Aldergrove. After nine years of this NDP Liberal Prime Minister, it is clear he is not worth the crime, chaos, drugs, and disorder. Uh, his radical experiment in British Columbia with taxpayer funded hard drugs and legalized street drugs has led to more crime, chaos, and disorder. Common sense conservatives have put forward a motion to put an end to this risky experimentation. So, will the Liberals vote with us to ban hard drugs, 
and to offer recovery and hope instead. Yes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. From the beginning, what we have offered is to help people through treatment, harm reduction, strengthening legislation. We are here to help people, to accompany them through their journeys. Everyone deserves full support. No one chooses to become addicted to drugs, and that's why we're there to help everyone. After nine years, this NDP Liberal Prime Minister is not worth the crime, chaos, drugs and disorder caused by his wacko policies. That's right. It's wacko to allow drug use in parks, hospitals and playgrounds. It's wacko that this government's policy is exposing kids and health care workers to lethal drugs. Will the Prime Minister and his government support our common sense motion to ban hard drugs and offer recovery, or will they continue with his wacko drug policies of, of legalized use of meth and fentanyl in children's parks? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We've engaged with experts with a range of views to learn from current experiences and inform this practice moving forward. We are working with all federally funded programs and have ramped up mitigation and enforcement measures. We expect provinces and territories to do the same, and the evaluation is ongoing. We will do what we need to do. The Honourable Member for Pitt Meadows, Pitt Meadows Maple Ridge. Madam Speaker, having eyes, why can't the Liberals and NDP see the death and destruction their radical drug experiment is having in Canada? Having ears, why can't they hear the cries of weeping parents and the loved ones of 42,000 who have died from opioids? When will the Liberals and NDP realize that their wacko safe supply and hard drug legalization is destroying this nation? Will they vote with common sense conservatives to ban hard drugs, stop taxpayer funded drugs, and put that money into detox and recovery? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam President, c'est justement parce qu'on est. Madam Speaker, we do listen to experts and we are attuned to people's needs, the needs of those who are on the streets using drugs. That's why we have options and solutions like strengthening legislation, harm reduction, treatment, and supervised consumption. That it, those are the steps we're taking. Madam Speaker, these liberals are more offended by their policies being called wacko than they are by finding needles on kids' soccer fields or skyrocketing overdose rates. Conservatives have put forward a motion calling on the government to ban hard drugs and offer recovery programs across Canada. Will this government vote in support of a common sense motion or will they continue pearl clutching over words like wacko? <laughs> the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. We had such hopes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Arm reduction is health care. Arm reduction is the door to the system. Safe consumption sites have responded to more than 53,000 overdose since 2017. Our government has invested $200 billion to support provinces and territories, delivering services needed in addition to the $1 billion we have directly invested to address this crisis. We will use every tool to, at our disposal to end the toxic drug and overdose crisis. The, the Honourable Deputy. The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean. 117 days. The federal government has been ignoring its civilian employees at Quebec's military bases for 117 days. They're on strike. Well, the government cannot ignore them anymore because their representatives from Saint-Jean, Bagotville and Valcartier are here today. They're here to ask why Quebecers have the lowest wages in Canada, to ask why Quebecers are treated like second-rate workers, and to ask why the Liberals have been ignoring them for 117 days. Will the government level the play pay scale and stop discriminating against Quebec employees in the forces? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I appreciate my colleague's question because it gives me the opportunity to talk about an announcement we made in April with the well-being services of the Canadian Armed Forces. We reached a settlement of non-public fund workers in Kingston and Petawawa. This agreement we've reached will increase by 13.75% uh, the salary 
over the next few years. No one is paid at minimum wage, and we hope that those who are on strike will reach a resolution, and we encourage them to come back to the table. The Honourable Member for St. John. Historically, the majority of civilian employees in the forces have been women in Quebec, and they're right to wonder why the federal government is discriminating against them. For example, they're right to ask why a financial services assistant in Bagotville deserves $10 less than someone doing exactly the same job in Ottawa. Strikers are right to demand equal treatment on all Canadian forces bases. And at a time when the armed forces are struggling to recruit, they should be demonstrating that they respect their employees. They are ready to come back to the table. They will be suggesting a new contract at 3.30 today. Will DND finally listen to them? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, once again, I thank my colleague for her question, and I appreciate the question, because we do know that it's possible to reach solutions and agreements together at the bargaining table, like we did in Kingston, in Petawawa, and here in Ottawa. The agreement that was negotiated will significantly increase salaries by 13.75 percent over three years. We hope that the three striking parties will return to the bargaining table. Madam Speaker, I wish to thank all employees working with our military bases and with our military families. The Honourable Member for both. Madam Speaker, after nine years of this bloc liberal government, the housing crisis is unprecedented. July 1st will go down in history, but not for the right reasons. This crisis is affecting not only large urban centres, but also our regions. In an article in La Presse this morning, the Quebec Police Association noted a significant increase in homelessness. This is a sad reality. It's caused by lack of housing and the rising cost of living. When will this bloc-backed government stop announcing programmes with even more bureaucracy and instead ensure that housing is built in the regions too? <laughs> The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, I appreciate the question. It's interesting because the member who asked the question does supports a plan in which we don't build affordable housing. The member is in favour of increasing tax rates for new apartment construction. That is not okay, Madam Speaker. Our plan is to invest and to build affordable housing. For example, we just reached a deal with Quebec to build 8,000 housing units. Meanwhile, Madam Speaker, the Conservative Party leader, when he was uh, housing minister, he managed to build a grand total of six housing units throughout the country. The Honourable Member for both. Madam Speaker, at that point, rent was half as expensive. The government should really follow the situation more closely. Now, after nine years, this government, with the support of the bloc, has voted for $500 billion in centralizing inflationary budget spending that is driving up the price of everything, pushing more people into homelessness across Canada. The government's failure to control its spending is the cause of all these problems. Add to that a carbon tax, and you'll understand the situation today. When will this bloc-backed prime minister stop wasting money so that Quebecers can start living and eating with dignity again? The minister. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have a great deal of respect for the mayor, the member for Beauce. He used to be the mayor of a, an important municipality in Beauce. Now, here's what I would like to know. The, how does he feel about the attitude of the Conservative leader? The Conservative leader, when he was housing minister, created a grand total of six housing units. And the leader of the opposition insults and continues to insult Quebec's municipalities and their leaders, calling them incompetent. How does he feel as former mayor of a Quebec municipality? How does he feel about being called incompetent by a Conservative leader who built only six housing units? The Honourable Member for Louis Saint-Laurent. Madam Speaker, does the Minister know Nadia Gagné? Has he heard of Natia Gagné? Natia Gagné is a woman who lives in a van. For the past few days, she's been living in a van. Why? Because she no longer has housing. There are 24,000 people in Montreal waiting for an affordable housing unit. The minister often forgets the number nine. Two terms as government plus one nine years in government. Is he proud of his government's track record? Is he proud of the situation today caused by nine years of his government? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
I thank the member. He is another member that I have a great deal of respect for. He is well respected and important in Quebec, and I thank him for bringing up Nathalie. There are many Nathalies and people like her in Quebec who need housing. It's a difficult situation in 2024 in Quebec. That's why people need a government that invests in them, not an official opposition who insults municipalities. Does he feel that insulting Quebec's municipalities is a sign of respect? The Honourable Member for saint leonard saint michel Madam Speaker, the Conservatives continue to show their true colours. The Conservative leader said he'd override the rights of Canadians by using the notwithstanding clause. On Tuesday, the member for Peace River Westlock introduced a petition here in the House to restrict abortion access. And on the same day, every Conservative member voted against a bill that would provide contraceptives to women who can't otherwise afford it. And yesterday, coincidentally, an anti-choice March for Life protest was held here in Ottawa. Can the Minister of Health assure women across Canada that the reprimable Minister of Health? Well, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member for her incredible advocacy uh, in making sure that women have uh, autonomy over their own bodies. And you know, it was so disappointing on the one hand to see, I, and I understand over half of Conservative members are anti-choice, and to see them speaking about them telling our daughters and telling our sisters what they should do with their bodies. Now that's upsetting enough, but then in the same order, to vote against women being able to get the reproductive medicine they need means that they want them to have no choice whatsoever about their bodies. Not a choice. Honourable Member for St. Albert Edmonton. Madam Speaker, the Minister of Employment pocketed money from his business partner, the same business partner that was lobbying the Minister's Department while securing $110 million in government contracts. Wow. Wow. Meanwhile, the Minister actively hid this shady arrangement from the Ethics Commissioner. For two weeks, the Minister has refused to answer the most basic question, so I will ask it again. How much did the Minister pocket? How much? How much? How much? The Honourable Minister of Health. The member well knows that the Minister has answered these questions, and of course he would not dare say the things that he just said in this chamber where he uses parliamentary privilege outside because he knows to do so would have serious consequences. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Rocky Ridge. Bring it on. Madam Speaker, after nine years of this NDP Liberal government, the Canadian Armed Forces have 16,000 personnel vacancies and a crisis of morale, recruitment and retention. That's why the Defence Committee unanimously voted to cancel the April 1st rent increase for base housing. Like other Canadians, our troops can't afford rent and groceries and know that this Prime Minister is not worth the cost. Shame. Will the Prime Minister show that he actually supports our troops and reverse the April 1st rent increase, yes or no? Here, 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 here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Um, Madam Speaker, I'll take no lesson, and I mean no lesson from the Conservative when it comes to defence spending. So, they let defence spending drop below 1%. They voted against actually a salary increase for our members. They voted against funding for Ukraine. They voted against Operation Unifier. They voted against $40 billion for NORAD modern modernization, and they badly mismanaged our procurement for years. So, Madam Speaker, today in this House, I have no lesson to take from that side. When asked by the media, the immigration minister clearly stated that all international students undergo a criminal record check to enter Canada. That is false. Police certificates are not mandatory for international students that enter our country thanks to this Liberal government. This immigration minister is following the exact same reckless path of his predecessor, who notoriously lost a million people. Why did the minister mislead Canadians, and can you tell us how many international students were let in without police clearances? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, for far too long, international students have been exploited and vulnerable from abuse and fraud. That's why we are taking concrete action. We implemented a new verification process to authenticate the acceptance letters. We raised financial requirements to ensure they are prepared for their lives in Canada. And recently, we announced a national cap on student visas. Madam Speaker, we have a responsibility to ensure international students are set up for success. And that's exactly what we're doing. 
The Honourable Member for Mississauga East Cooksville. Madam Speaker, international trade is very important for Canada, supporting roughly one in six jobs nationwide. While Conservatives in this House voted against modernizing free trade with Ukraine, cheering on damaging and illegal bridge blockades, and supported Brexit, on this side of the House, we know that Canadian businesses, innovators, workers, and exporters benefit from a strong, stable, progressive, and rules-based international order. Can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of International Trade kindly update this House as to how the government is standing up for free trade on the global stage? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. I had the honour of attending the OECD ministerial meeting where I met with key allies and stakeholders to discuss the importance of inclusive, resilient and sustainable trade, especially in the space of rising populism and protectionism. We know that promoting free trade and investments uh, grows the economy, creates good jobs right across Canada, and I'd like to thank the member from Mississauga East Cooksville for his important work as we work together to advance Canada's trade agenda. Thank you. Honourable Member for Esquimalt, Sandwich Soup. Madam Speaker, this government promised to remove criminal records for simple possession of drugs for more than 250,000 Canadians. After two years, we are still waiting for the government to act because the Liberals are saying this is hard to do. You know what's hard, Madam Speaker? Not being able to get employment or housing or to travel to see loved ones because of a criminal record. These records disproportionately impact Indigenous and racialized Canadians and all those living in poverty. Will the Liberals keep their promise and meet the November legal deadline to make sure all of these simple possession records are removed? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Madam Speaker, I greatly appreciate that question as our government agrees that, and we are committed to dealing with the systemic racism and discrimination that often is in our criminal justice system. It is why I welcome working with the member opposite to meet our November 2024 deadline to implement C5. Madam Speaker, we are working with partners like provinces and territories to do just that. There is more work to be done, but we are absolutely committed to creating a fair justice system because that creates safety. For communities. Here, here. 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 Here.